Right. Good afternoon again, and welcome to our Kawasa Wednesday Water Webinars. I think that's how you have dubbed it. So I'm going to adopt that name, Kawasa Wednesday Webinar. And this is number eight in the series. Of course, um, we want to thank all of those of you who participated in the incident command system training and which we have promised that in the first week in September, we should put on another one for those who missed it. This evening, we will have as our presenter, Mr. Vikar Ruplal, who has presented for us before. And so I will just let to remi remind you or just let you know that she is um, the Analytical Service Division Manager at Kaizen Environmental Services Trinidad Limited, uh, who holds overall responsibility for development, management, and operational efficiency of all activities in the laboratory, including field sampling services, wet chemistry, trace metals, organics, objectives, analytical procedures, quality assurance requirements, problem resolution and general project management. Ms. Ruplal holds a Master's of Engineering in Process Engineering. She's a project management professional, PMP, Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt, and a diploma in Petroleum Engineering. She holds a Level Two Wastewater Treatment Operator Certificate from the Association of Boards of Certification, the ABC of the USA, and has also completed the ITEC sewage treatment processes in India. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Ms. Ruplal to take, to take the floor, and she will introduce her presentation. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's Avika again. I know I spoke um, earlier. Just a small correction to um, the introduction given before. So I was the Analytical Services Division Manager for Kaizen. That is no longer so. So that's just that small correction. Uh, today's presentation, we're going to do a water laboratory monitoring and controlling of water quality. Are you all able to see my screen? Any uh, issues seeing the screen? I know last time I presented, the slides wasn't changing. Uh, everybody able to see my slides? Is the slides changing? Are we moving from one yeah. to two? Yes, that's yeah? going on well. Thank you. Good. Great. Okay. So why do we measure, uh, well, monitor water and control the quality? Water quality must be monitored and controlled so that we make informed decisions regarding health and environmental issues. And why do we need to do that? Because water is part of the environment that we live in and we use water for a number of things as humans. We have water being used for drinking and household needs. That includes bathing, drinking, cooking, cleaning. We use water for recreational uh, purposes, uh, swimming, fishing. Uh, in industry and commerce for heating, cooling, processing, washing, diluting, uh, agriculture for watering crops, feeding livestock, uh, in medicine for hydrotherapy, hemodialysis, the generation of electricity, hydroelectric power, uh, steam turbines. So we use water for a number of things. And the water quality is really used to alert us to current ongoing and emerging problems. It is also to determine compliance with drinking water standards and to protect uh, the water for other beneficial uses. It seems to be giving me trouble here. Right, the water cycle here uh, show is uh, really shows again the water cycle so it's a closed loop system and it shows how rainwater becomes surface water and groundwater and then the relationship between domestic commercial industrial water and wastewater to surface and groundwater hence the importance for adequate water and wastewater treatment and then with treatment which is why we need to monitor and control the water quality because again like i said it's a cyclic process 
the quality of water could change as a result of soil entering your water systems through events such as erosion, land clearing, overgrazing, chemicals through fertilizers, pesticides, and leaching, uh, pollution from the refuse of factories, sewage systems, mines, service station, uh, garbage disposal, both small scale and from uh, landfills. The following table here by Mebeck and Helmer shows freshwater deterioration or at a global level. And it compares the impacts of pathogens, suspended solids, decomposable organic material, eutrophication, nitrate as a pollutant, salinity, heavy metals, acidification of rivers, lakes, reservoirs, groundwater. And a lot of these parameters we would talk about throughout the presentation. And it really shows you what the impact is and which is significant, which is not relevant. The second table here again are from the same source uh, shows the sources and significance of pollutants resulting from human activities. And these activities include things like atmospheric transport, urban sewage, industrial effluents, agriculture, urban waste and runoff, industrial waste disposal, uh, you have uh, water from navigation and harbors. Uh, your pollutants include bacteria, nutrients, trace metals, pesticides, herbicides, and or industrial organic pollutants, oil and grease. And again, as I said, we will talk about some of these uh, later in the presentation. Uh, having now defined why we need to monitor water quality and uh, sort of giving an introduction, there has to be some sort of standards uh, to guide the monitoring and control. Uh, water quality standards are usually provisions by state or federal law that describes the desired condition of a water body and the means by which that condition will be protected or achieved. To protect human health and aquatic life, the water quality standards are established and these form a legal basis for controlling your pollutants. The criteria could either be numeric, so that could be like the maximum pollutant concentration levels permitted or narrative, which is like a criteria that describes the desired conditions of the water body. And this could be like free from something. Uh, drinking water is usually as per the World Health Organization guidelines. And table A, 3.3 of the 2017 guideline uh, provides the guidance values for chemicals that of health significance in drinking water. Again, it's a lot, so I'm not gonna mention every chemical here. And I don't think I have time to go through each one, but we would go through a few of them uh, later in the presentation. Effluent discharge, uh, it usually depends on country, state, or region. For Trinidad, we have the Water Pollution Rules 2019. Uh, this, the Water Pollution Rules uh, 2019, basically has three schedule. The first schedule uh, lists parameters and substances, and the quality condition or concentration at which the substance of parameter is defined as a pollutant. So again, that is where we go back to control and uh, monitoring, because how this is how you know that you know at this concentration now it's a pollutant. The second schedule again lists parameters and substances and the permissible levels for the each receiving environment. But Trinidad, we have receiving environments like inland surface water, coastal near shore, marine offshore environments, the sensitive areas and or groundwater. And then we have a third schedule, again, which lists parameters and substances and the ambient water quality standards for fresh waters. And when we talk about fresh waters here, we're talking about the protection of aquatic life and aquatic ecosystems, water supply and recreational use. Like I said earlier, the uh, discharge usually varies from country to country. Some other examples are NPDES permits, Clean Water Act, LBS protocol, so that brings us now to the fun part, the analytical methods, because we're here to talk about water laboratory. So there are a number of analytical methods. I'll sort of go through each uh, quickly, and then we'll go through the parameters or the substances uh, that, well, that we will monitor or control. Again, it's impossible to go through all, but we'll try to cover as much as we could in uh, my short time. So volumetric titrations, uh, this is quite uh, familiar, and I think um, most of us would be familiar with volumetric titrations. This is something that could be done and is probably done uh, by operators 
or engineers on our water treatment, wastewater treatment plants. This is where chemicals are analyzed by titration with a standardized titrant. A titration endpoint is identified by the development of color resulting from the reaction with an indicator by the change of electrical potential or by the change of a pH value. Calometric methods is another very common and popular one. Again, most of our um, operators, engineers would have been uh, you know, very familiar with using calometric methods. And these are based on measuring the intensity of color of a colored target chemical or reaction product. The optical observance is measured using light of a suitable wavelength. The concentration is determined by means of a calibration curve obtained using known concentrations of the determinant. The ultraviolet or UV method is similar, except that it uses UV light. For ionic materials, the ion concentration can be measured using an ion selective electrode. The measured potential is proportional to the logarithm of the ion concentration. Some organic compounds absorb UV light in proportion to their concentration. UV absorption is useful for a qualitative estimation of organic substances because a strong correlation exists between UV absorption and organic carbon uh, contents. Now we move on to uh, spectrometry, atomic absorption spectrometry. Uh, some uh, on-site labs may have it. Uh, quite often, uh, this may be uh, you know, to more commercial labs. Um, you know, once we get certain things right on the plant, do we expect the parameters that are monitored by these tests to also be right? So in atomic absorption spectrometry, it's used for the determination of metals. It is based on the phenomenon that the atom in the ground state absorbs the light of wavelengths that are characteristic to each element when light is passed through the atoms in the vapor state. Because this absorption of light depends on the concentration of atoms in the vapor, the concentration of the target element in the water sample is determined from the measured absorbance. And we have like Bell Lambert law that describes the relationship between concentration and absorbance. I'm not gonna go through those. Uh, uh, further on, we have the flame atomic absorption spectrometry. A sample is aspirated into a flame and optimized. A uh, light beam from a hollow cathode lamp of the same element as the target metal is radiated through the flame and the amount of light absorbed is measured by the detector. This method is much more sensitive than the other methods and it's free from spectral or radiation interference by coexisting elements. It is not suitable for simultaneous analysis of many elements because your light source is different for each target element. Then we have electrothermal atomic absorption spectrometry, and this is based on the same principle as the flame atomic absorption spectrometry. An uh, electrically heated atomizer or graphite furnace replaces the standard burner head for the termination of the metals. In comparison with the flame atomic absorption spectrometry, electrothermal atomic absorption spectrometry gives higher sensitivities and lower detection limits and a smaller sample volume is required. It suffers from more interference through light scattering by coexisting elements and requires a longer analysis time than your flame atomic absorption spectrometry. Then we have ICP methods. So you have the ICP AES, which is atomic emission spectrometry. Again, it's for the determination of metals. It consists of a flowing stream of argon gas and is then applied radio frequency. The sample aerosol is generated in a nebulizer and spray chamber and then carried into the plasma through an injector tube. A sample is heated and excited in the high temperature of plasma. The high temperature of the plasma causes the atoms to become excited. On returning to the ground state, the excited atoms produce ionic emission spectra. A monochromat is used to separate specific wavelengths corresponding to different elements and a detector measures the intensity of radiation of each wavelength. A significant reduction in chemical interference is achieved, and it has similar sensitivity to your flame atomic absorption spectrometry or your electrothermal atomic absorption spectrometry. ICP, again, we have the ICP-MS, which is ICP mass spectrometry. Again, yeah, 
elements are atomized and excited, uh, similar to the ICP AES, and it's then passed through a mass spectrometer. Once inside the mass spectrometer, the ions are accelerated by high voltage and passed through a series of ion optics, an electrostatic analyzer, and finally, then the magnet. By varying the strength of the magnets, ions are separated according to their mass charge ratio and then pass through a slit into a detector, which records only a very small atomic mass range at a given time. By varying the magnet and electrostatic analyzer settings, the entire mass range can be scanned within a relatively short time period. So then we now move on from ICP methods to chromatography methods. Chromatography basically is a separation based on affinity differences between two phases, your stationary phase and your mobile phase. Your sample is injected into a column, either packed or coated with the stationary phase and separated by the mobile phase based on the difference in interaction between compounds and the stationary phase. Compounds with a low affinity for the stationary phase move more quickly through the column and elute earlier. The comp compounds that elute from the end of the column are determined by a suitable detector. You have ion chromatography, where an ion exchanger is used as a stationary phase, and the eluents uh, for the termination of anions is typically a dilute solution of either of hydrogen carbonate and sodium carbonate. You have calorimetric, electrometric, or titrometric detectors can be used for determining individual anions. In suppressed ion chromatography, anions are converted to their highly conductive acid forms in the carbonate bicarbonate element. Anions are converted to weakly conductive carbonic acid. The separated acid forms are measured by conductivity and identified on the basis of retention time as compared with their standards. You have high performance liquid chromatography. This is a technique that uses a liquid mobile phase and a column containing a liquid stationary phase. Detection of these separated compounds is achieved through the use of absorbance detectors for organic compounds and through conductivity or electrochemical detectors for metallic and organic inorganic compounds. Yeah. Then you have gas chromatography, which permits the identification and the quantification of trace organic compounds. And the GC, gas is used as your mobile phase and a stationary phase is a liquid that is coated either on an inert granular solid or on the walls of a capillary column. When the sample is injected into the column, the organic compounds are vaporized and moved through the column by the carrier gas at different rates depending on differences in partition coefficients between the mobile and stationary phases. The gas exiting the column is passed to a suitable detector and you have uh, flame ionization detectors, electron capture, nitrogen, phosphorus. The separation ability is good, so mixes of substances with similar structure, they are systematically separated, identified, and uh, quantified. And then you have the GCMS, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry method. And it's the same principle as your GC method, uh, just that it uses a gas, uh, mass spectrometer as the detector. The, as the gas emerges from the end of the GC column opening, it flows through a capillary column interface into the mass spectrometer. The sample then enters the ionization chamber where a culminated beam of electrons impacts the sample molecules, causing ionization and fragmentation. The next component is your mass analyzer, which uses a magnetic field to separate the positively charged particles according to their mass. And you have different types of separating techniques. The most common are quadruples and ion traps. After your ions are separated according to their masses, they enter the detector. And then the final one, we have the bridge and trap um, columns. And these are applicable to the determination of uh, various purgeable organic compounds that are transferred from the aqueous to the vapor phase by bubbling purge gas through the water sample at ambient temperature. The vapor is trapped with a cool trap. The trap is heated back flush, and then the same purge gas to dissolve the compounds into the GC column. Right, 
so we talked about methods there and we talked about some of the tests already. So we know about metals, we know about uh, organics, um, we know about some inorganics also. So we'll go through some of the tests that are usually performed by operators here on the plants and these really guide our treatment processes, whether it be water treatment or wastewater treatment. So temperature, temperature, it helps to determine your rate of biochemical reactions. If your water temperature is too high, this limits your water's ability to dissolve oxygen. Uh, your solubility of your oxygen decreases as your temperature increases. pH also decreases with increasing temperature. And we know that the pH, your pH and your dissolved oxygen is are two important characteristics for your treatment process. Yet the procedure for measuring your temperature will depend on the type of the thermometer that you use and on whether there's direct access to the point at which the temperature is being measured. If you're using a glass thermometer and the testing point uh, is reachable, then the thermometer is immersed in the water until the liquid column and the thermometer stops moving and then you record your temperature. If you're using either a glass or electronic thermometer and the measurement point is inaccessible, you obtain a water sample of at least one liter, you rinse your thermometer or your probe with a portion of the sample, you discard the rinse water, then you immerse your thermometer or your probe in the remaining sample. You hold until the temperature becomes constant and you record that as your temperature reading. If you're using an electronic thermometer having a probe with long leads, then you lower the probe to the required depth. You hold it at the depth until the reading on the meter is constant and you record the temperature. pH, pH measures your acidity of your water. Uh, most organisms, again, they have a range of pH that they would survive in. Um, again, the water quality standards also gives guidelines for some of these parameters. So um, yeah, at certain uh, concentrations, it's still the pollutant, and then there are certain criteria for this charge. So your pH is usually measured. You can have a number of ways, pH indicator, paper, liquid, calorimetric indicators, electronic meters. pH paper indicator paper is simple and uh, relatively cheap but it's not very accurate and it requires a subjective assessment of color by the user. The liquid calorimetric indicators change color in accordance with the pH of the water in which they are mixed. The color that develops can then be compared with a printed card or your colored glass standards or a set of prepared liquid standards. The calorimetric methods are simple and accurate to about 0.2 pH units. The main disadvantage is that the standards for comparison or comparator instrument must be transported to your sampling uh, location. Physical and chemical characteristics of your water may interfere with the color developed by the indicator and lead to incorrect measurements. Your third method, which is your electrometric pH measurement, is accurate and free from interferences. You have pocket-sized battery-powered portable meters that gives readings with accuracies of up to plus or minus 0.05 pH units, and they're suitable for field use. You have more sophisticated models that can give accuracies up until uh, plus or minus 0.01 pH units. The electrodes used for measurement generally need a uh, periodic replacement. Wood of poor quality electrodes often show a slow drift in your readings. You have conductivity and salinity, which is a measure of water's ability to conduct electricity, which provides a measure of what is dissolved in your water. So we're ready to dissolve ions here. So when you have salts and other inorganic chemicals dissolved in water, they break into tiny electrically charged particles called ions. These ions increase your water's ability to conduct electricity. They uh, common ions that conduct electricity are sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride. Because these salts and other inorganic chemicals conduct an electric current, conductivity increases as your salinity increases. Organic compounds, however, such as your sugars, oils, alcohols, 
do not form ions that conduct electricity. Again, you have your aquatic animals and plants. They have a range of salinity that um, they can live in. Outside of this range, they may negatively be affected or they could die. Salinity also has effects on water chemistry and density. Both are measured by an electric probe on a data logger. The probe measures how much electrical current moves through the water. Your salinity is then calculated from your conductivity value. Conductivity is determined by measuring how easily an electric current flows between two metal plates called electrodes and are, and are spaced at specific distances apart. Your dissolved salts in solution will be attracted to the plate with the opposite charge. In many probes, a four electrode cell is used. Two of the electrodes measure the current of the solution, while the other two electrodes maintain a constant current between them and are used as a reference. Dissolved oxygen, again, measures the amount of oxygen dissolved in the water. Without this, aquatic life is unable to conduct cellular respiration and thus a key indicator of water health. So um, your discharge water has a, a dew. Uh, for Trinidad, it's usually uh, created on 4 milligrams per liter. Um, in your wastewater treatment process, also in your aeration basins, you will maintain a dew so that you can have the biological uh, treatment or these biological reactions taking place, which uh, results in your treatment. So your dissolved oxygen uh, concentration depends on the physical, chemical, and biochemical activities in your water. Changes in your dissolved oxygen concentrations can be early indications of changing water conditions. Two main methods for determining your dissolved oxygen is your Winkler method and your electrometric method using membrane electrodes. The Winkler method requires the addition of chemical reagents to the sample. Uh, soon after it's obtained, the dissolved oxygen concentration in milligrams per liter is determined by titration with a sodium thiosulfate solution. Uh, this could be done in the field or it could be done up to like six hours later in your lab. The electrometric method is suitable for field determination of your dissolved oxygen. It requires an electrically powered meter and an appropriate electrode. The result requires application of correction factors to compensate for salinity and temperature. Most meters have correction factors already built in in them. A lot of plants have online uh, dio probes, uh, so they, it measures the, the dissolved oxygen uh, within the process itself. You have redox or ORP, which oxidation re reduction potential. So it measures the oxidation or reducing potential of a water sample. It indicates possible contamination, especially if it's industrial wastewater. For example, you have excess chlorine in our wastewater effluent will result in a large positive value. And presence of hydrogen sulfide will result in a large negative value. Your RP is determined by measuring the potential of a chemically inert platinum electrode, which is immersed in this solution. Your sensing electrode is read relative to the reference electrode of the pH probe, and the value is presented usually in millivolts. Your ORP can sometimes be utilized to track metallic pollution in groundwater or surface water, or to determine the chlorine content of a wastewater effluent. ORP is a non-specific measurement. Uh, the measured potential is reflective of a combination of effects of all the dissolved species in the water. It is used to control disinfection with chlorine and chlorine dioxide in cooling towers, swimming pools, portable water supplies. Bacteria's lifespan in water is also um, determined very much by your ORP level. So once you know what your ORP level is, you will know whether, you know, your bacteria could thrive or they can't, or they'll have, uh, you know, challenges thriving. In wastewater, your ORP measurement is used frequently to control the treatment processes that employ biological treatment solution for removing your contaminants. The table here presents some key biochemical reactions and the corresponding ORP uh, ranges. So these are the ranges in which you know these processes will take place. 
So again, this is the importance of measuring your ORP and making sure that you have a oxidation reduction potential in the range so that your reactions could take place to affect the treatment that you want. Residual chlorine. And this, and I spoke about chlorine in my first presentation and we went through the whole disinfection process, the way we use chlorine. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on chlorine here. Uh, the residue of chlorine indicates a sufficient amount of chlorine has been added to the water to so activate the bacteria and some of the viruses in water and that the water is protected from recontamination during storage. The presence of residue of chlorine in drinking water is really correlated with the absence of most disease-causing organisms. Uh, you measure residue of chlorine, you have color wheel test kits, um, they use like a powder or the chemical uh, DPD and it causes a color change, a pink color change in the presence of chlorine. The color wheels are simpler and less expensive than the digital meters. You have digital color meters that are more accurate way to measure the residue of chlorine. And these color meters, basically you add the DPD or tablets or the powder to your sample vial containing your sample water. It causes the color to change pink you insert your vial into your meter and the meter reads the intensity of the color change by emitting a wavelength of light and, and then automatically determining and displaying the color intensity. And this is what we explained with the calorimetric methods before. So the res chlorine, residual chlorine is really a calorimetric test. Then you have turbidity. Turbidity is a measure of the degree to which water loses its transparency due to the presence of suspended or colloidal particles. And turbidity can result from things like phytoplankton, sediments from erosion, resuspended sediments, waste discharge, algal growth, urban runoff. Turbidity is measured in uh, NTUs, neophlymetric turbidity units. The instrument is a neophlymeter or turbidity meter. And it measures the intensity of light scattered at 90 degrees as a beam of light passes through your water sample. Again, this is a color metric method. And I think these are pretty easy and um, most people are able to do these tests um, themselves. Uh, these tests usually, and for all of what we've discussed before, should really be done uh, on site or as soon as possible, as soon as you take the sample. Uh, in lakes, you can measure your turbidity using a Sechi disc. This is a black and white disc, as the one seen in the photograph here, that is dropped in the water attached to a rope. The depth at which the disc reaches before it disappears from sight is recorded, and this provides an estimation of the turbidity. Turbidity measurement could also be used to provide an estimation of your total suspended solids concentration. Uh, you have things like the COD. Um, some places they may or some it may go to a uh, external laboratory. So a COD is used really to measure the, or monitor your water treatment efficiency. The test uses either your yeah, potassium dichromate in a 50% sulfuric acid solution that oxidizes both your organic and inorganic substances in your water sample which results in a higher COD concentration than your BOD concentration. For the same water sample, since uh, your BOD measures only your organic uh, compounds, right? So your COD is your chemical oxygen demand, and the, the BOD is your, right. Uh, they you have two methods for measuring your COD. The first method, uh, include it's the use of the vials which is the closed reflux method so you have sealed vials where the water sample is uh, put, uh, pipetted into the vials because these are a really small amount uh, you have like high range and low range vials so pre-prepared vials so the sample is put into the vials it is heated for some time and then it's read off on a calumet the calorimeter and it's again based on a color change from orange to green. The, you can have COD measured by titration also. So it's measured using a strong oxidant. And this is like your potassium dichromate, your potassium iodate or potassium permanganate under acidic conditions. So an excess of the oxidant is added to the sample 
Once the oxidation is complete, the concentration of organics in the sample is calculated by measuring the amount of oxidant remaining in the solution. This is usually done, like I said before, by titration using an indicator solution. Your study is expressed in milligrams per liter, which indicates the mass of oxygen consumed per liter of solution. Now we move on to your solids testing here. So you have your mixed liquor of suspended solids, which is a characteristic waste water term, and then total suspended solids, uh, which is more referred to in water treatment. Your mixed liquor is really a mixture of your raw or settled wastewater and the activated sludge contained in an aeration basin in an activated sludge process, which is a wastewater treatment process. Your mixed liquor of suspended solids is a concentration of suspended solids in that mixed liquor, and it's usually expressed in milligrams per liter, similar to your TSS. Uh, within these aeration basins, your things like your DO, your pH, your ORP, your active biological biomass, mixing rate, rate of oxygen utilization, temperature are critical factors that must be closely monitored and controlled so that your uh, treatment process or, or the chemical reactions that result in the water treatment is actually occurring. Your MLSS and your settling basins is usually measured taking grab samples and the process is similar to the TSS filtering drying weighing to constant weight. Your standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater. Details of few methods for the determination of solids, all of most of which is based on filtering, drying, and weighing. Your MLSS or your TSS could also be measured using calorimetric methods. Uh, we discussed calorimetric methods earlier. Certain manufacturers has also created like online probes and analyzers utilizing the measurement of transmitted light and scattered light to determine your solids concentration. And while we have the standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater, it's really a manual of all, all the test methods that you can use for the analysis of your water and wastewater. Uh, yes. It talks about your chemical, biochemical, microbiology, toxicity, uh, they, all the they water tests. And like I said, it's impossible for us to go through all. So we're really just kind of skimming the surface here and I'm sort of just picking out a few that we will go through. We have these settleability tests and these are, again, more particular to wastewater testing. And it's an analysis of the settling characteristics of an activated sludge uh, mix liquor. And this is usually done by you collecting a, a well mixed sample in a 100 ml graduated cylinder. You allow it to settle your solids with either settle oil or the flute. You record the volume of solids at five minutes intervals for like 30 minutes. And then your sludge solids are recorded and interpreted as a percent settled volume in a given time period. So if you have like a 1000 ml uh, measuring cylinder, uh, the volume observed multiplied by 0.1 equals your percent of solids. So if you have a settled sludge of 20 ml in a 1,000 ml cylinder, this would equate to a 2% settled sludge. During your first five minutes of your settleability test, the bacteria will come together, forming a large clumps of flux. These flux particles are slightly denser than water, and this helps with the settling and compaction. After initially clumping together, the flock begins to settle toward the bottom of the container, squeezing the clear liquid out and up toward the surface. A large, open, and irregularly shaped flock particle that has little density will settle slowly, compacting poorly by the end of the test. This biomass settles too slowly. An MLSS that has a small, round-edged flock particle that are dense will settle rapidly. This type of MLSS may leave uh, much more turbidity or cloudiness in the liquid water above the settled sludge. The biomass appears granular and settles too fast. Perfect settling is not too fast or not too slow. It should form a large flock particle that settles well and also traps fine particles that make up the turbidity around the flock. The biomass should produce a clear liquid above the settling solids. You have your sludge volume index, which is calculated by dividing your settleability, which we just talked about, 
uh, by your MLSS, and this is always in milligrams, uh, well, milliliters per gram. And uh, after that, yeah, we do have the bacteria test. Uh, typically, uh, what is done by the operators or on the plant itself are usually the, the simple presence or absence test. So usually in the form of test kits, uh, there are a number of manufacturers of test kits. Uh, for more detailed testing and our actual counts, um, these samples need to be, one, they need to be handled properly. They need to be taken in, in proper sterilized containers. These are usually done by an uh, external lab. And these are things like your total coliform, your fecal coliforms, your uh, legionella, you have a number of other bacteria. Yeah, so um, you know, to test you test your bacteria, you would test your residual chlorine. But in most cases, uh, these would go to an external lab to be tested. Uh, the tests usually performed by external labs. Uh, metals, we talked about metals a lot before. So I'm not gonna go back through the procedure for testing metals. Um, some labs may have, uh, uh, some plants may have fully equipped labs that might have AS, ICPs, uh, GCs, um, but most labs on the treatment plants would probably not have. So your um, suite of metals, which are usually uh, heavy metals, are usually metals that are not naturally occurring in water. And these are things like aluminum, antimony, arsenic, beryllium, bismuth, copper, cadmium, lead, mercury, nickel, uranium, tin, vanadium, and zinc. And they find their way into water bodies through natural processes or human activities, such as mining, processing of minerals, your use of metal containers, transportation through metallic pipes. Heavy metals are known to cause uh, kidney harm, liver, nervous system, and uh, bone structure damage. You have lead poisoning in humans can cause problems in the synthesis of hemoglobin, kidney, and gastrointestinal tract joints and reproductive systems and acute or chronic damage to so the nervous system. Lead also causes osteoporosis and weakened bones because it starts replacing the calcium in your bones. Long-term exposure of cadmium levels leads to renal dysfunction. High exposure can lead to lung cancer and osteodynastrophy. Nickel has numerous reported mechanisms of toxicity, including redox cycling and inhibition of DNA repair, as well as exhibiting allergic effects. Mercury can lead to tremors, gingivitis, and other psychological changes with spontaneous absorption and congenital malformation. Um, monometal mercury causes damage to the brain and the central nervous system. Vanadium affects the liver, kidney, nervous, and cardiovascular systems. And we talked about the various methods for metals, right? Those were the ICP, or you could have the ES. Pesticides and herbicides are typically GC methods. Um, ex the health effects from a pesticide would depend on your pesticide. The organophosphates and carbamates affect your nervous system. Others may irritate the skin or the eyes. Some pesticides are also carcinogenic. Uh, others may affect the hormone and endocrine system of the body. The organics, again, we talked about those. This would be uh, more the, the chromatography methods. Um, they cause the increased risk of cancer, or reproductive difficulties, increased blood pressure, liver, kidney, organ damage, problems with reproductive systems, anemia, and others. And what we have here for five, six, and seven nutrients, these are usually a chemical element or compounds essential for plant and animal growth. And these are things like ammonia, organic nitrogen, cadetial nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, total phosphorus. These are simple tests. These could be calorimetric. So it could be either or. It could be done at the labs on the plant. So it could be at an external lab. Uh, your total organic carbon, again, there's a calorimetric method as well as our instrumentation method. Um, but if we're doing things like a COD, and um, then there's not really, um, once you monitor the COD, you should be fine there. 
uh, your BOD is an indirect measurement of your biodegradable organic compounds. And this is a five-day test. This is typically not done on the plants. These would normally go to an external laboratory. The COD though encompasses your BOD value and it's a much faster measurement. So if you have a chemical oxygen demand, yeah, that already encompasses your, your biological uh, oxygen demand. And the oil and grease, which is probably one of the most common parameters for quantifying organics from human sources, they tend to be from illegal dumping into storm waters, uh, motorboats, oil spills, discharge from oil producing platforms. And again, these are more GC based methods. And this really brings us to sort of the, the end of the parameters that I will discuss. So we would have gone through uh, physical properties, solids, organics, nutrients. And once we go through um, the physical properties, once we get the physical properties right in our treatment systems, it tend to and will take care of the other things like the organics, the nutrients. Once you have your reactions taking place, so once you have things like your pH, your temperature, your dissolved oxygen, your ORP, your maintainer, your, your MLSS, you have your residue of chlorine, then um, you know these things are taken care of. It will sort itself out in the treatment process. So once the treatment process is happening and you have these uh, physical properties intact, chances are the, the risk of having your heavy metals or your pesticides string up on your effluent is sort of very low, which is why these are just routinely checked by an external lab. And really this is a point where I would take questions if there are any questions. Right, thank you very much. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but please go ahead. Um, participants, if you do have questions, um, please do. Seems everyone is very quiet this afternoon. Or was that? Um... We have no questions in the chat room at this point. Everybody has disappeared. That's very much unlike you. Well, I think um, it doesn't seem that we we have an engaging um, audience. I think perhaps, oh, I think somebody's saying that they're interested. You want to go ahead with that, Ms. Um, Miller? You can unmute and go ahead. Oh, oh, she says um, she can't use the mic. She's saying that she is very interested in the methods for the COD. Okay, so COD method, um, the standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater, it's, us it's a public um, document, really. So um, if you go to that and you look for, so if you Google search that and you... Um, the standard methods you get a copy of the book and uh, the COD method I, is there I mean they have like uh, three or four you have closed reflux open reflux uh, number of methods so from there you can actually because I, I, I can't go through the entire method or read the entire method so um, what I would suggest is you go through the method from there if you need help in finding the method then um, I, I suggest you send me an email and you can email me at rea-replal, r-o-o-p-l-a-l at hotmail.com and I can send over copies of the methods for you. If you're having trouble you, putting your hand on the method. You want to put, just type, you, you could just type, um, Devika, your, your email in the, in the chat. So that okay, yeah. Thanks for those who... Could, could I ask uh, 
the Victor question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, with our present COVID-19 situation and um, the risk that our population faces, what test can we use uh, maybe on the wastewater side for COVID-19 from a laboratory perspective, uh, thinking about a water lab or wastewater lab? Right. And when we talked about this earlier in my first presentation, when we were doing disinfection and the fight against COVID-19. So according to the guidelines of WHO and the CDC so far, there hasn't been any evidence of transmission through uh, the wastewater or the water. They have detected uh, in one or two places the virus, but no transmission. So uh, and then in past studies, uh, and if I remember this, we had, I think, two uh, COVID viruses before, I think was the one of the SARS and another Middle East uh, virus before, and the current mm -hmm. disinfection uh, processes are uh, proved, uh, you know, adequate or sufficient in dealing with doers. So in terms of COVID-19, it would be ensuring that we have proper disinfection techniques and then we measure the bacteria. So uh, in terms of your fecal or your total coliforms uh, exiting your plant, so that is for both your water and your wastewater treatment. So ensure that you're properly disinfected and you have a residual uh, chlorine dose <coughs> if you're uh, disinfecting by chlorine and you know to make sure that you do your bacteria testing on your water yeah um, i'm just saying that um you know i'm thinking that total coliform and fecal coliform they they both non non-specific tests right um they give you a, a general idea of bacteria colony count but actually drilling down to know well whether or not COVID-19 or SARS virus or one of those is present. Um, I'm kind of guessing it might be early, early days yet to have a method, but are you seeing anything on the horizon? Um, no, because uh, again, based uh, the research, even what CDC and WHO and um, some of those have published, there haven't been anything published yet. Again, the COVID-19 is spreading through droplets. So um, again, what they're seeing is the disinfection uh, normally takes care of all your bacteria or your viruses, or for the most part, most of them. So um, uh, in the past or so far, it has not been you know, resistant to the current disinfection technique. So right now, the advice is to continue with the disinfection and just monitoring um, the bacterial levels in the effluent or outflow water. Okay. All right, I'm seeing here, so somebody asked what temperature, what would the temperature, what would the water temperature have an effect on the result of the turbidity test? Well, your turbidity test, I'm not sure why temperature here, but this should be done uh, as soon as. Um, and yes, temperature would have a small impact because you would have things dissolving or precipitating based on your temperature. But the test should be done uh, pretty much at the same time. So once you take the sample, once that sample is well mixed, because you want to know the turbidity uh, within the, the condition itself that it's being discharged. So um, that test should be done um, almost as soon as you can take the sample and not to allow for any um, temperature adjustments or any standing time because then you can have things uh, dissolving into solution, precipitating out of solution, you have separation. So you want to ensure that you have a well mixed sample. 
I'm seeing here, somebody's asking, what is the maximum allowable limit for chlorine in portable water? So for portable water, in terms of the water distribution systems, uh, different guidelines give different amounts. Uh, most places it's 0.3 milligrams per liter. Some of the literature would say up to 0.5 where it's discharged from all wastewater treatment. So some industrial wastewater treatment, they would say less than one milligram per liter. But for drinking water, usually I think in most instances, it's less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. Yeah, okay, good. We have had some questions and thank you as always, uh, Mr. Jones. And um, I know you all wouldn't disappoint. Uh, very good. Yeah. Well, we're... Um, afternoon, I, I have a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, I didn't hear anything mentioned about ammonical, ammoniacal nitrogen. However, that is one of the parameters that is tested um, in waste water. Um, what is the method for testing um, ammonia, ammoniacal um, nitrogen? And what could be the potential cause if you have something like a high range? Right, so ammoniacal nitrogen falls in the category of the nutrients, uh, which we kind of talked about. Um, Again, the, the methods for the nutrients, so ammonical nitrogen, you can have the Nestle method. There's a titration. There's also a titration and calorimetric method. Um, so this usually um, has like a digestion procedure. You have the uh, DPD packets again, and you look for a color change. Normally, your um, uh, nutrients are normally taken care of in your nitrification and denitrification step in your wastewater treatment. So once you have uh, that anoxic zone followed by your aeration zone, that would take care of you know, removing all your nitrates and your nitrogenous compounds, including your ammonia. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's good questions there. Anyone else? Um, if you don't, um, we're right on about an hour since we started, and I think. But it's it's your show, so if you have questions or comments or little experiences you have with your own working in your own labs you and you wish to show with us please feel free to do that um, i should tell you that we are um we have contacted a number of other presenters for the following weeks um i think next week um we we uh, we will have confirmation by tomorrow but we we should have some exciting um presentations um, there's one of them in, in about two weeks time, we will have from one of our, it's the first time we're going to get a supplier of some product. And of course, it's going to be a generic type presentation, but still we'll be able to, you know, introduce us to some of what they're doing. So we're trying to get that good balance as well as uh, we hope to do something in line again with now that we are getting in the uh, middle of the hurricane season that we may get someone to do something in that regard and so we will keep you posted and the recordings as usual we're going to send them to you and we will also post them please visit those of you who are not yet um, following us on work, our workspace which is designed so that you can keep in touch and find material that we're going to post there in which you um, participants can also share your experiences on that on that site. So it's Kawasa works at um, work, workplace. 
Um, I, and if you wish, you can always send us an email. We also post the recordings on the Kawasa website. And those of you who I have in our, I have on WhatsApp, I also would share um, the recordings via WhatsApp as well. So thank you everyone for participation and a special thanks to the Vika for um, coming at the last minute to rescue us with a presenter this afternoon. I want to thank Mr. Gill, who is always in the background, giving us a lot of support um, with his team in Trinidad. And we're happy that those of you in Trinidad are participating. Um, we, we hardly see, um, I, I, I think we've been keeping track on you as well. Um, I know we have good participation from the guys at the Wasco in Dominica. Um, I think one or two from St. Lucia. We have St. Vincent is always there. Um, and, and of course, I saw when um, Tesfa from Antigua, APUA, and I think we have a few there. Um, we normally have some, a few people out of the Cayman Islands. And Ecohesion, yes, ever, ever present to the team out of Ecohesion. We would like to also recognize you um, and for your participation. So thanks again and have a good evening, everyone. And see you next week at Kawasa Wednesday webinars, as you have called it. See you next week. Thank you very much.